I think we are recording, yes. So, um, hello everyone, this is Karline and I invited Emma. Um, we were a bit nervous because we are using a new technology and that's always um, a little bit uh, stressful, but I think we made it. So, uh, we can see Emma, we can hear Emma <laughs> uh, and myself. So, let's go into the topic um, the reason why I uh, invited Emma for this conversation because is because I think Emma is working on a topic which I was completely unaware of until rather recently, and I think it can be uh, revolutionary uh, for many women. Um, and it is actually about how we as women... Uh, can live more in flow, can live more in, um, yeah, in harmony with who we are, with our nature, um, because I realized that actually very often we are not doing that and we are going against our nature and this leads to uh, us pushing harder, uh, trying to do more, where actually I think a lot of the insights that, that Emma will bring can help us women to, yeah, to live more in flow, to be happier, to do less, to be more. Uh, so, um, yeah, very looking forward to this conversation. Um, Emma, um, we got to know each other through a, a joint uh, client that we were working for. Uh, where you gave um, a, a talk about bi the biology of leadership. Uh, and I think uh, that's already a very important thing uh, to know about you, that you are a biologist. So maybe can you uh, introduce yourself? Um, what, what should we know about you? Oh, thank you so much, Colleen. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today to have this conversation about the subject, which is so fascinating. So thank you for having me here today. Um, so yes, I am a biologist by background. I studied biology. I did my undergraduate in biology. It was a long time ago, though. And um, actually, then I spent quite a long time, 17 years of my career in the corporate world, um, and all the time I was, I was wondering about, oh, there's something about that knowledge that I gained during my degree, which feels really relevant to leadership. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time for me to actually realize this is what I want to do. Actually, this is something that's absolutely fascinating. Um, so after 17 years in the corporate world, I left. Um, I'm now a coach, an executive coach. But something that really, really fascinates me is how our biology impacts our leadership, how we show up at work, our interactions, our relationships. And it's actually really, really huge. Um, and so I started to go back to my roots as a biologist through applied research. Um, I buried myself deep in academic papers for well, wow. quite a few years, actually, a long time to refresh my knowledge and to um, to ensure that I was really like understanding the developments because the developments in biology have been huge, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so now I feel I'm really up to date as far as my knowledge is concerned. And I think that this subject is so fascinating for women because something that women do all the time is to actually silence or downplay um our biology, our feminine biology. And of course, the biology is, is huge. <laughs> it applies in so many different areas. Um, but but we women tend to downplay our normal feminine biology and silence that. And actually, there's huge power in it. Huge power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember, Emma, uh, during the talk uh, that you gave, you opened up with the question, the professional world is uh, created by men for men maybe can you explain a bit about that yes yes thank you Colleen so it's, it's a bit of a controversial statement isn't it to say that the business world is designed by men for men and I feel a little bit uncomfortable even naming that um 
But actually, it makes sense because the first organizations contained only men. And so they naturally evolved rules based on on what worked well for the group at that time. Now, you could say arguably that those rules don't work for anyone anymore because so much has changed. But actually, the business world has been designed by men for men. And there are these rules um, which we set up way back at the start of organizations, which still persist today. And and when I say that the um, the business world is designed by men for men, actually, I think that same statement applies to uh, the world of healthcare as well, where actually um, in the past, it's been very common for the male body to be studied as the default, which means that we know so much less about the, the non-male body. So that might be the female body, but it might also be the bodies of people who are transgender, who are intersex, non-binary, or those who don't identify as either sex. So we know so much more about the male body than we do about mm. all other bodies. And actually, we could go so far as to say there are parts of the surface of Mars that we know more about than we do about the female body. And there are parts of the deepest parts of the ocean that we know more about than we do about the female body. Um, and that's, it's, it's really, it's really upsetting even to say in this day and age that that's the case, but unfortunately mm-hmm. it is the case. But I, I like to look on the positive side and say, well, actually this presents us with an enormous opportunity here. And I'm really interested mm-hmm. in the opportunity and the upside rather than um, feeling depressed or worried about the past. Mm-hmm. I think uh, cool. I think one of the um, one of the, the the things we could start with, and I think uh, that's something we as women we all do know. But uh, I think there's a lot of awareness uh, missing about the impact. Is that we all have, uh, or we used to have, uh, a, a cycle, a female cycle, and I think. Uh, Many of us uh, look at it as something which is more annoying and we, which we would uh, avoid if we could. And, and I think many of us try to avoid it uh, with, with all sorts of, of, of medication. Um, but what I thought uh, what was really revolutionary was how you could actually use this cycle to your... Um, benefit and how uh, a better awareness of of the different uh, season as seasons as you call them could actually help us being more in flow and and doing things um, at in the right time um, and avoiding to do other things at, at some other moments in time. Um, so yeah, super curious about that, um, and and maybe you can tell a bit more, like like how does that work? Yes, and I'm I'm so excited to be having this conversation, Carly, because I think five to ten years ago we probably wouldn't be having such a conversation as we're having mm-hmm. today. But I can see there's been so much more research, so much more interest, and so much more knowledge um, that we now have about the menstrual cycle, which is incredible, really, because like you say, this can be used to our advantage rather than something that we have to either ignore or find frustrating or simply just power on through and just get on with, because I think that's the kind of default. We just power on through because because we are, we can, um, and actually then we lose some of the wisdom of of the cycle. But I've been I've been so interested, and I've had the privilege to interview some Olympic athletes about how they've been using their cycle uh, to huge advantage. In, in their professional life as, as female athletes and how it has been um, groundbreaking in terms of understanding their own performance um, and leading to huge gains. So I think it's, it's really useful for both performance but also for maximizing health and well-being. And, mm-hmm. of course, you could say that the business world is very different to the world of sport, but actually I think that the same opportunity can be applied to the business world. And it's it's really the same with sport because you could say, well, you can't design uh, the dates of sporting fixtures around your period 
In the same way, of course, you can't design the world of work around your period, like the financial close needs to happen at the time the financial close needs to happen. And an important presentation with an investor needs to happen on the date that that's set. You can't design these things necessarily around your cycle. But what you can do is to be aware of the natural changes that take place within your cycle. These these are brain changes and they're hormonal changes. And this awareness then um, can give you so much that you can use to harness um, to maximize performance. And I think more importantly, to maximize health and well-being as well. And um, we're speaking about a cycle, so there's not really a, a clear starting point, but where would you prefer to start? So, well, maybe we could start if we're going to dive in now to the cycle and talk a bit more detail about how the cycle changes um, as we move through it. Maybe we should start at the time that we call day one of the cycle, which actually um, marks the start of the menstrual bleed. Mm -hmm. So when we have our period, the first day of our period, we call day one of the cycle. And of course, every woman has a different cycle. Um, there's no right length. There's no wrong length. Um, on average, a cycle is probably um, between 27 and 35 days, something like that. It might be slightly shorter, might be slightly longer, depending on the individual um, who's having that cycle. Mm -hmm. And I want to say up front that any individual experience trumps anything that I'm going to name here. So it's really important to honor your own individual experience of the cycle. Mm -hmm. But if we go back to that bleed time um, with that marking day one of the cycle, um, to use to use metaphorical language, um, many researchers liken this time of the bleed to the season of winter. And if we think about it from an energy perspective, during the time of winter, that's when our energy is most inwards. So it's the time probably that we feel least social, um, least like doing a presentation in front of 100 people. Um, we, we're, our energy is much more drawn inward. So we're far more self-reflective during this time. Um, so we might want to be alone. Um, and actually, we might feel a bit spaced out um, during this time uh, because of the drop in hormones. This is when our, our main sex hormones, which are estrogen and progesterone, there are also others, but I won't complicate matters by going into those. Um, the winter is the time that these two hormones are at their lowest. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean it's how, a, how we feel? Oh, sorry. Yeah, how, how do we how do we feel? Um, so it's probably a time that we feel most tired. Um, and, and it's a really good time for us to rest and reflect. And there's this huge gift that winter offers us. But the trouble is that because most of us are so um, concerned with pushing on through, powering on through, feeling like we have to achieve, um, we sometimes lose the gifts that winter can offer us. And really what it offer us, offers us is this amazing inward focus so we can come up with amazing creative solutions to problems that we might have been actually thinking about for quite some time if we allow ourselves to surrender to it. And most often we don't. We don't allow ourselves to surrender it, to it because we're too caught up with the busyness and the push, push, push. And, and I'm not saying that a woman has to like stop and, and do nothing during her period. That would be very nice, of course, but the world doesn't allow us to do that. And I do want to say that women can do anything during their periods because women have run, won marathons, achieved amazing things during their periods. So women can do anything at any time. And I want to make that very clear. Um, but if we honor the cycle, actually winter is a time for more rest, more reflection, and actually really thinking um, about problems that we might have because these amazing creative insights can, can come mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, so more uh, the time where a retreat would be perfectly suited. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and more self-care during this period. Like, and it doesn't mean that you need to, as I say, stop work. But if you can build more 
self-care time into your schedule during your period, time to go out on a nice nurturing walk, time to have a bath, time to sit down and have a cup of tea, um, then those things can be really, really helpful during this bleed time as our energy is a bit more inward and we're a bit more vulnerable. Yes. And it can also be good I, I, to yeah. minimize social engagements. Minimize? Social what engagements. I, ah, yes. So so actually uh, what's interesting is that now I would say I am on day three, so I should have a very inward uh, time of the month. And then, as you just said, sometimes it's difficult to plan accordingly. So uh, yesterday I had a funeral of my grandmother where I was speaking uh, for the whole group. Today I'm going to go uh, to a conference. So, so it's, I'm actually doing the opposite of what would be uh, being mm-hmm. in flow with. But I think uh, because I already learned a few of those things from you. So what I did yesterday is that um, in between, uh, right after the funeral, I really felt super tired. And normally what I would have done is I still had a lot of work to do. I would have gone straight into work. But I didn't. Uh, I went into my bed. I took a nap, a one-hour nap. Afterwards, I went for a walk. And honestly, um, it really felt much more uh, respecting my my body. And and I I don't think I lost any time because today I felt I have more energy than I would have had if I would have pushed through. So... uh, I, I think it's not it's sometimes it's difficult to plan but what we can control like like this little nap or more self-care I think we, we should do that yes absolutely and I love what you just said there Colleen about honoring yourself and your body and actually realizing that because you did that mm. you didn't lose time you didn't lose productivity in fact you probably gained it because you listened to the needs of your body rather than pushing on through. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a really a really beautiful observation. I have another question, Emma, because uh, I'm doing uh, uh, yoga in the morning and uh, Ashtanga, which is more like the, the the very masculine active yoga. And in yoga, they in in these classes, you're actually discouraged to come to classes when you have your period. So, so my question to you is, what what would be your recommendation? Can we do sports or better avoid it? Yeah, that's a brilliant question, Colleen. And I think again, it depends on on yourself as an individual and how you're feeling. And sometimes when we're having our period and we're a bit crampy. Um, it can feel not nice to do exercise, but actually it can be really beneficial as long as it's the right type of exercise. So I, I completely agree with what your yoga teacher is saying. But however, if you were to change the type of yoga class you do and maybe do more like a yin yoga mm. um, or uh, like a gentle walk or maybe a swim it's 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 those those kind of exercises that are a bit more gentle and nurturing on the body that are really really nice to do during the time that we are having our period because we'll we'll notice certain physical symptoms as well during this time so we we might be a bit crampy um we might maybe be a little bit more bloated depends we might be bloated before the period or during the period it depends on the individual um and then we have these um we have prostaglandins, which are contracting our uterus um, and, and actually making the blood come out. So we might uh, feel that our bowel movements are a bit more loose. So we have all these physical symptoms going on. And any way that we can honor those physical symptoms through gentle exercise and self-care is brilliant. So it's really about feeling what feels right and, and especially not pushing anything during those days. Yes, absolutely. But also, sometimes it's tempting to feel like nothing feels right. And you just want to curl up in a ball, which is which is lovely. Mm. But I I want to I want to say that actually, if you if you can get outside, and if you can do a walk or something really gentle, um, that can be really, Mm. really beneficial. Okay. After winter comes spring. And it's funny, because what's the day today? 
It's the start of the spring. It's the equinox. Yes. So uh, what can we expect during spring and how related to our cycle? Yes. So so as we move out of winter and into spring, um, estrogen starts to rise. And, and what we notice about this time is, is like spring, the season, um, during during our cycle, it's actually a season of possibilities. So we, we move from an energy inward state of the cycle to more of an energy outward state of the cycle. So we're craving more company at this time. And we're becoming a bit more playful, a bit more lighthearted. Um, we're becoming more agile, more flexible, and actually increasingly resilient. And we notice also that we might be more curious, perhaps more creative at this time during spring. Um, so it's it's really a time for new possibilities. And if you're working for things like public speaking, for interviews, um, for strategic thinking, uh, and starting new projects, it's a, it's a really playful time. So. Yeah brainstorming uh yeah really the, the starting of of new things yeah good to know and and um how long does it last more or less or again so it depends on the person yeah. um but if we're thinking that winter lasts on average four to five sometimes six days um we might be looking at day six to day eleven. Mm. Um but it really depends, of course, on the individual and the length of time of your cycle. Mm -hmm. So, so it's so, the so, time between the bleeding stops and somewhere halfway your cycle. Yes, just before halfway. So if we say that we typically ovulate halfway through our cycle, um then we we move through winter spring and then a little bit of summer before we ovulate mm. so that's how the seasons move in terms of the um the ovulation so uh we're moving into summer before we ovulate okay so spring is about starting new things being playful uh going from inside a bit more outside and then i'm super curious what what's Uh, summer is about is it more so, of this or it, it is it is more of this so summer is the time when our energy is most outward um so a, as uh we ovulate so our estrogen rises and peaks just before we ovulate and then as we ovulate um after we've ovulated progesterone starts to rise And so at this time in summer, we are at our most social. We often think about, uh, you, you know, sometimes when you feel like you're superwoman, you're firing on all cylinders. This is, this is your summer when you just feel so full of energy and confidence, actually. Spring and summer is a time when you look at yourself in the mirror and you just feel like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling good about myself today. And then autumn and winter are times that you look in the mirror and go, oh, don't feel so good about myself today. Um, so it's it's a time, obviously, when our energy is most outfit, outward, when we're level-headed, when we are really articulate. Um, and if we're thinking about it from a work perspective, this is a time to actually like get on and do your challenging work, to, to do the stuff that you might have put off because it just feels really difficult Actually, this is the time when you have the energy to do that more difficult work. Um, it's a time to push yourself. It's the time to ask for a promotion, perhaps. It's the time to have difficult conversations with colleagues if you have to give difficult feedback. It's also the time that you're most open and receptive to receiving feedback. Um, mm -hmm. And it's good for your networking, for your sales calls, um, so it's a really good time to to put yourself out there, I would say. Say yes mm -hmm. to the possibilities that come your way yeah. in summer. And I, I once heard that you are actually actually more attractive. Is, is that a myth or, or is, is that uh, true? 
So that's a good question. There are some studies that state that you are more attractive, like the face shape changes. Um, I'm not sure that those studies have been backed up, uh, mm-hmm. but there are studies that say that the mm-hmm. face shape changes and it makes you more more attractive more during that time. Attractive. But you can think biologically that makes sense, right? Yeah. Because if we're releasing an egg and actually we want to procreate, then it makes sense that even if the face shape changes or not, we feel more attractive which is mm-hmm. yeah interesting interesting um yeah and also um i love this idea of of uh women we have uh, and maybe we can discuss a bit later um more into depth but i think many of us women we have learned uh to get what we want in a very masculine way like by chasing it by going after it Whereas I think what you just uh, came to explain um, reinforces my belief that that it's much more powerful to 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 do it the female way and to to learn to to be magnetic and to attract the things you want uh, in in a very feminine way, which is not so much by doing a lot, by but by just being in your very magnetic energy and and attracting the things uh, and let them come towards you. Absolutely, Colleen. I think that's an amazing thing. Yeah. I think it takes it takes a, a certain amount of surrender though to do that because we are so used to living in this this masculine uh well I guess where we're, we're in love with the masculine yeah. because even the cycle has masculine parts and feminine parts and the parts when our energy is most outward are the more masculine parts mm-hmm. and they're typically the parts of the cycle that everyone finds the easiest mm-hmm. um because we're more used to living in that way mm-hmm. um so I do believe that the feminine has this most amazing gift mm-hmm. that it offers So summer is actually very nice. We feel comfortable, com- confident. We can sell things easier. We are we have more energy. Uh, after summer comes um, autumn. Oh, yes, and fall. Fall, yeah. Uh, what happens then? Yes, great question, Colleen. So the transition from summer into autumn can be a bumpy one, actually, because we go from being really extrovert and articulate and in the zone to actually our energy turning inwards again. And so we might want to detach a little and withdraw, and we might find ourselves becoming less sociable with less desire to go out. Um, And we actually experience more physical symptoms as well during this time of autumn. So Um, We might have more breast pain and tenderness um, and we might have bloating. And so it's the time that we probably feel more anxious um, and the time that our inner critic has a field day. Um, So because we feel less social, it's probably a time that if we're in a meeting, we feel less like speaking up in that meeting. And then later on in the evening, The inner critic arrives and gives us a hard time for not speaking up in the meeting um, and becomes quite critical. But actually, when we when we know more about this and we realize it's the time that I'm feeling more inward, it's not the time necessarily that I feel comfortable speaking up in a meeting. We can be a little bit easier on ourselves and realize, okay, actually, we don't have to be super vocal all the time. Um, It's okay sometimes to be a little bit quieter. So it's a it's a difficult time, but actually it also comes with um, with something that's really powerful if we again allow ourselves to surrender to it, and that's that we have this amazing helicopter vision during this time. Mm. So it's a great time for um, for completing projects, for editing, for organizing, um, and for really deep focus and thought. So it, it can mm. be a really amazing time if we allow ourselves to to really just surrender to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, sounds like uh, a time I haven't been honoring enough yet. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's indeed like like 
if if I listen to your 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 overview of the seasons, my first reaction would be I want to be in summer all the time, but uh, sounds very tiring as well. Um, and indeed, the the projects that we started in spring somehow they need to be completed, and and then maybe uh, it's in those days of the month that we can plan if we are able to um, for more blocks of uh, deep focus work, uh, finishing tasks, um, yeah, um, connecting the dots maybe. Um, yeah, super interesting, super interesting because because I think all of the activities need to be done and I think if we somehow can influence a little bit um, what activities we do on what days because of course some as you said some we have no influence on and we cannot uh, control the agenda entirely but I think yeah um, honoring more those times of the month and, and adjusting as much as we can our schedules and, and what we do uh, to those, I think that can be uh, very powerful uh, because it will probably feel much more natural to do it that way. Yes, yes, it really does. And I think so often we're, we're, we're taught that having a period is almost like a shameful thing. Mm. And there's research that shows like if a woman drops a tampon out of her bag, that she's viewed as being less capable than a woman who's not dropped, who's dropped a pen, for example, out of her bag. Um, and there's all this shame um, and negativity associated with having a period. And so it's really typical for us to just silence this part of ourselves. And it's so sad, really, when we think about it, because it's such a, it's such a natural part of being a woman. Um, and if we can embrace it, then it, it can offer us so much opportunity. Yeah, it's amazing. The, actually. We, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Yeah, because in the end of the month, we, we can do as much as men can do, I think, the difference will be that, that the way we do it is different throughout the month, whereas um, men, they probably have more like this steady daily uh, energy levels or productivity levels. Or, or, or do I miss something there? Well, well actually, men have, have a daily cycle. Oh. Um, so, yes, and, and their daily cycle is pretty well suited to the working day, which is, which is very convenient. Um, so they have testosterone, which, which rises um, and peaks in the morning and then falls during the afternoon. And it, it actually just really suits the working day. Um, but, but women have a monthly cycle. And it, I, I always like to think about it like um, if we think about our circadian rhythms and we think yeah. about how we feel if we don't live in harmony with the circadian rhythm, for example. So if we sleep at night and alert during the day, that's that's the best way of doing it. And you'll know yourself if you're jet lagged or if you pull an all nighter, the impact on your body is really significant, actually. And it's shown that regular disruption to the circadian rhythm can increase the risk of cancers. And we see this very commonly with people who do night shifts, for example, who are awake when their body should be sleeping. And and so we know that and we do tend to honor the circadian rhythm where we can. And it's the same with the menstrual cycle. It's just that we don't understand that so well and we don't honor it so well. It's really fascinating. Yeah, and you said, now, now you're explaining that there is a male cycle too and it, it, it has a high energy in the morning and then a bit lower in the afternoon. That explains a lot why... Uh, we are taught to do high focus work in the morning and then maybe do more of the creative work in the afternoon. But actually, that's very much based on the male cycle, if I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so if we can also incorporate our female cycle more into what we do when, uh, that would be much more healthy in a way. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, it's super interesting. Um, so to make it very practical, what what women who listen to 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 this and and um, I think the first step would be that they become aware of of the cycle, yeah? because I think we all know when we bleed, but that that's where it stops. I think for many women. So yes, yes. Any how, how would you track uh, your cycle or how do you do it? So I think I think it's it's really important for women to become aware of their cycle. Mm. Um, and how it varies, because not every woman has a regular cycle, for example. So it's good to track your cycle. And there are many different ways you can use to track your cycle. You can use an app. Um, you can use good old fashioned pen and paper. There are many different ways. And you just need to find the, the, the best way for you in, in terms of tracking your cycle. But it's important, I think, to notice, of course, when your bleed time is, but how your energy changes throughout the month. Um, and what your predominant mood is um, on a particular day. Like, do you feel really productive? Do you feel really resilient? Do you feel playful? Do you feel creative? And of course, you know, there'll be changes um, throughout the day. Um, you might start the day feeling really energized and then actually have something difficult that comes your way and, and end the day feeling not at all energized. Mm -hmm. um, but it's helpful to notice what's what's the predominant mood feeling of my day and collect data on that your own data and then notice your own patterns um so many women i speak to tell me that they are so much more self-critical just before their period and actually just to know that is so helpful yeah. because it means that you can just be a little bit kinder to yourself yeah and actually uh, i think that brings us nicely to to something that we women are generally not good at and it's uh, setting boundaries and uh, saying no, um, especially maybe during some parts of the month. Um, well, yeah, uh, sorry, I, I made the link because I feel a lot of women, they, they are super bad at putting boundaries, including myself, I, I say yes to most requests. <laughs> um, how can we, um, yeah, I'm looking for the right question. Do you have any idea why we are so bad at, at putting our boundaries? Or is there also a biological, historical uh reason for that i think that's an excellent question colleen and i think if we think about the modern professional woman um i i feel like women have come into the world of work feeling that we need to compete with men to prove that we're not just as good as men but better mm. because we're judged against men or at least historically that's what's happened So women haven't been celebrated because of their differences. And I think that this, because we're in this, we must compete mode, makes us more likely to say yes, because we don't want to say no, because then we might be viewed in some way as, as weaker or as not effective. So we are more likely to say yes. Um, and I think that, if we can shift our thinking into actually that saying no sometimes can be hugely powerful mm. and doing less can actually make us more productive and more healthy yeah. um, and increase our well-being, then it's it's a complete shift in mindset. Yeah. And it's difficult. It's actually really difficult mm. because we don't want to be viewed in a negative light. Yeah. And that's, typically what makes us say yes of course of course I can do that for you knowing that it's going to have to you're going to have to stay up till 11 o'clock at night to do that thing that you just promised to do yeah and I also uh, recently read an inter interesting point of view uh, of somebody who, who talked about the fact that for ages um, it was totally normal that men could do with women whatever they wanted because we were seen as kind of 
inferior. Eh? We couldn't vote, uh, we couldn't drive. Um, and so, so we were so used to, yeah, being uh, at service of men. And, and maybe that can also be part of the reason why almost genetically uh, we're still like into um, pleasing much more than we would want to. Yes, I think I think you can't separate biology and socialization. They, mm-hmm. They're just so interlinked in this huge cultural influence that we have. Um, I mean, we just go back as far as as far in time as you can trace back. Mm-hmm. And Aristotle talked about them men being uh, superior to women. Darwin, I'm I'm a huge mm-hmm. fan of Darwin because I'm a biologist. Oh my! God. But even he said. Thus, man has ultimately become superior to woman. Um, so we 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 come with this with this um, societal imprint of, of of culture and conditioning, and um, I, I really think it's time it's time to change that. Mm-hmm. And um, I I I'm I'm super excited and fascinated um, by by so many male views these days who who really are supporting women and recognizing that that women are incredible um and actually these rules these historic rules of the organization just don't work for anyone anymore Mm -hmm. and so it's really interesting when you start to think about well what could an organization look like if we just threw away this rule book and we started again with a blank sheet of paper and i don't think anyone has the answers to that yet but I think it's really, it's really exciting to think about that because it's not just women who are an underrepresented group. Of course, there are lots of other underrepresented groups as well. Um, mm-hmm. And these groups also face huge challenges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, I had another question uh, about um, sleep. Um is there like, yeah, because of course, to be uh, thriving in life, I'm always taught that sleep is the first thing. Like, like no sleep is no energy whatsoever. Is there a link between sleep and the cycle? or, or um... there, there is actually, Colleen. And I think um, that there is, we, we, we probably need to do more, more scientific research mm-hmm. on this. Um, but we know that the hormone progesterone is uh, is a, is an amazing hormone. It's actually not as well studied as its sister hormone, estrogen, but it's actually hugely beneficial for women's bodies. And if we don't ovulate, we don't actually produce progesterone. And so actually having progesterone in the body is is enormously beneficial. It It's it's very calming, actually. And if we have progesterone, it helps us to sleep better. This is why um, when women are in perimenopause, sleep can be difficult, actually, because progesterone drops during the time of perimenopause. We could do a whole other podcast about that. Um, But actually, in the time when we have progesterone, which is um, progesterone starts to rise after ovulation, so it's rising in summer, um, and then it begins to drop as we as we move into autumn. Mm-hmm. So we might find that during um, perhaps later autumn um, or even the start of autumn is is when we are starting to feel like we're not sleeping as well. And sometimes people notice when um, both the main sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are lower during winter and the end of autumn, that's when sleep can feel more difficult. Of course, it's dependent on the individual and not everybody operates in that pattern. Um, But you might notice that your sleep is not so good during those particular times. Yes, you touched upon something very uh, interesting because I didn't know of these uh, benefits of progesterone. But does that also mean that if you take uh, birth control uh, pills or maybe other uh, ways of birth control, that this has an impact on, on, on sleep and on the hormone? Yes, it does, Colleen. Um, so actually, let me talk about the, the oral birth control pill. Yeah. 
to start with. Um, and so what happens when we take the oral birth control pill? I, I wish I wish that when women went to see their doctors to talk about going on the birth control pill, because so many women go on it, not necessarily for birth control reasons. Um, they go on it for all sorts of other reasons, actually. Um, but when women go on the pill, they're not told about the potential negative side effects mm. that can happen. And when we take the pill orally, we're taking the synthetic hormones and we, we're losing the natural benefit of our own hormones. And so what we notice when we take the pill is that we don't have the downs, but we also don't have the ups mm. either. Um, and so what some women notice when they take the pill is that they might feel um, maybe a bit more detached Um, We know that actually depression can increase when women go on the pill Mm. um, and there's increased risk of blood clots, increased risk of certain cancers. Um, And the other thing that we don't get told when we go on the pill is actually that um, there might be some shriveling of our genital tissue. So the size of the entrance to the vagina can decline. Um, And generally, women report having less sex when they're on the pill. So you go on the pill so that you can have sex and then actually perhaps you don't want to have it so much. Um, And it might increase pain during sex and decrease frequency of orgasm. So there's all these things that can happen to us while we're on the pill that we don't necessarily get told when we go on it. Mm -hmm. And something that I think is really interesting coming out in in the new studies is that... um, going on the pill can actually reduce bone density in teenagers because teenagers are still um, growing their healthy bones. And actually um, we, we need, we need this, um, we need this process called bone modeling, which is taking place as our, as our bones are maturing. And actually um, there have been associations between the pill and um, generating sufficient bone density, Mm -hmm. which is not something I went on the pill when I was 17, I think, and nobody told me that it might impact the way my bones would form. Not at all. And so I just wish that there was more education because I think like the, I absolutely agree that we should be empowered to choose our method of birth control, absolutely. And I believe that women should have access to birth control. It's super important. But I also believe that we should be told about the risks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Like uh, the pill has been uh, invented by men for women. <laughs> I don't know how that went, but it uh, seems like there was not enough female uh, touch on the... Uh, uh, development of it um, okay but that, yes. that's super uh, revolutionary to know because I think uh, indeed we all got prescribed the pill from very young age and we have no idea of the only thing we know is that it will uh, help us not to get pregnant or maybe uh, reduce some uh, acne uh, but that's it that's about it Um And that also explains why in my environment I see more and more women uh, getting rid of uh, the pill and uh, looking into more natural ways of uh, birth control. Yes, because what the pill does is it suppresses ovulation. And if you don't ovulate, then you don't produce that lovely natural progesterone. Mm -hmm. Um, And what about, uh, you call it coil, right? The yes, so, so the the um, the the wow. IUDs, so the wow. interuterine devices, yeah. um, yes, could commonly referred to as the coil, or you call it the spiral, right? Yes, yes. In, in Belgium, yes. Um, so these, I think, are are much better than the oral pill in terms of like they they still provide up to ninety nine plus ninety nine plus percent. Um, safety so so stopping women get pregnant um but they also do suppress 
um, the, the natural hormones. Mm. So, um, and it depends on the type of uh, IUD that you use. So if you use the copper IUD, um, then that doesn't actually give any hormones at all. You keep your natural hormones um, yeah. and it just, the, the copper ions pr- um, prevent the sperm basically from from, yeah. from getting where they need to get to. So the, the mm-hmm. copper IUD ensures that your hormones remain as is. So you get all the natural benefits of the hormones. However, there are some negative side effects reported with the copper IUD. And many women really don't like to use it because it gives them heavy periods. In comparison, the IUDs, which um, which are hormonal in nature, things like the Mirena coil, um, mm-hmm. what they do is for the first year or so, they can suppress ovulation and then um, for the second year, they suppress ovulation less. So I think the stats are, I don't have the figures exactly to my to, to hand here, but I think the stats are um, up to 85% of cycles are suppressed the first year. And then maybe something like 15% um, as you move on. But of course, you still are uh, prevented from being pregnant, which is great if you don't want to be pregnant. Yeah. Um, so they are much better for you than taking the the, the pill. Um, however, you still don't get the natural the natural benefits of of the hormones. But for many women, that's fine because um, that's their preferred method of of birth control, with which causes uh, the least side effects. Yeah. So it's all about individual choice. Yeah, but I think it's interesting that we are aware of what we're choosing for and yes. um, yes. that we know which are the benefits that we are missing uh, or yeah that we can make the right choice I think I think that's important yes absolutely yeah. I think access to information is really really important yeah. Emma I feel we can go on forever on this topic and I think there's so many more things that we didn't discuss like we didn't discuss nutrition um oh, very, important very practical um but we have good news because uh 26th of april you'll be coming to belgium for our uh, flow day retreat which is uh, designed for women who are curious how they can uh adopt all this knowledge about female biology um, into their day-to-day uh, lives, uh, into their professional context. Um, so on that day, we will be uh, making all of this, what we just discussed, uh, much more practical. Uh, and I think that's that's where the real uh, magic will happen, is, is how can we integrate this into our daily lives. Uh, also, um, talk a bit more about sleep, nutrition, exercise, uh, setting boundaries because I think it goes very. It's very closely linked to to uh, what we've just been discussing. Um, yes. Yeah. And absolutely. And and there's so much more that we can talk about actually the period itself, like having the bleed, that we really did not go into today. We just scratched the surface. So there's so much more that we can discover. Okay. So I'm really looking forward to coming to Belgium. Yes, yes. So uh, if you listened and enjoyed uh, our conversation today, uh, then I would uh, advise you, we still have a, a few spots left. Uh, go to www.unplug4848.com slash flow. Um, and then uh, I would love to, uh, we would love to see you. Uh, it's it's going to take place in, in Blackhof, which is, uh, for those who don't know, it's a super nice uh, venue in the middle of nature, a little bit outside Antwerp. Uh, it's actually an old castle which has been transformed into a retreat location Um, so yeah and we will be mixing uh, scientific knowledge of Emma with very practical exercises sharing amongst each other 
and also some holistic uh, experiences. Uh, so it's going to be a mix of uh, very uh, cool experiences and uh, would be lovely to have you there. So, Emma, uh, see you on the 28th and uh, thanks for, uh, for being here now. Um, I think you're doing great work yes. and uh, I hope more people can, can enjoy uh, whatever you, you have to offer. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Colleen. But I'm just going to double check that date. You said the 26th, and then I think we just said the 28th. It's the 26th, right? Ah, we said the 20th. Ah, sorry. It was the 26th. It's a Friday, so uh, it's the perfect end of the week to taking uh, to be taking uh, a day for yourself. 26th of April, uh, a one-day retreat, um, uh, living more in flow and harmony with your um, female biology. So be there. Yes.